Hello, Chris. How are you? Very so, good. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so our next talk today for our Julia Day, uh, which started with Vidal, uh, now continues with Chris, uh, who is using Julia to research scientific machine learning, focusing on how the randomness from scientific data can be used to uncover the underlying mechanistic structure. He's the lead developer of differentialequations.jl and Pumas AI. Uh, so your talk is going to focus on how the language is changing scientific research. Um, so welcome, Chris, and you're welcome to share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, so everyone sees my screen? Yes. All right, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Rakakis, uh, MIT Mathematics, also a few, a few other things. So um, I'm a senior research analyst in the School of Pharmacy at University of Maryland, uh, uh, Baltimore. And I'm also the, uh, the director of scientific research at Pumas AI, which was mentioned actually in the previous uh, talk. So um, what, what, I'm, what I'm going through today is the composable abstractions that are required to make scientific machine learning a discipline. And so I wanna go through, first of all, you know, what is scientific machine learning and everything, but I, I really wanna showcase how the Julia programming language has given us a tool to be able to really build and compose software in a way that we really haven't before and how, and how that really opens up new opportunities for developers. So a lot of the big machine learning started in Python, right? So, you know, everyone knows about TensorFlow, JAX, and PyTorch, right? So these big machine learning frameworks really started in Python. And so a lot of people think that, you know, there's, there is a advantage that is there in Python, right? So it's been there for a while. They've had these developer resources. They've had Google and Facebook involved. And so does that mean that in the future, machine learning will be happening in Python, right? And that's one of the questions that Vero was given, right? What, 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 is, what is the future of our discipline? Disciplines. What is the future of development in software and machine learning? And it might seem like, well, if Python was in the past, and so therefore there's a lot of Python packages, um, that might mean that Python is the future. But what I really want to make a case for is that's not the case. It's not as clear cut as you might think it is. Um, and one thing, way to be able to kind of see that that might be what's going on or might be an issue is Swift for TensorFlow. Right, so Google did abandon Python as the main platform they'd be looking at for TensorFlow. And when Google wrote that, this down, right, they said Google's why, you know, they wrote this down. You can search why Swift for TensorFlow. They have this whole article that describes in the final section, right, like how did they make their decision? They said in the end, it narrowed down to the technical merits of Rust, C, Swift, and Julia. Right, so Rust and C++ were, um, were discarded be, uh, due to usability concerns. Essentially, most people don't want to, you know, have a language where you have to, you know, you have to have a different compilation step and, you know, make files and all, all these extra e issues are things that they see that, you know, scientists don't want to have to handle, right? And that's one of the reasons why these interactive languages like Python became very popular. Um, and where what what they what they ended up with was saying that they're going to go with Swift because of implementation details and they because they they knew the internal compiler right but the other thing on the list is Julia, and so I, what I really want to showcase is you know how we have been able to get the, to essentially be, have a competitor to you know Google's brand new Swift for TensorFlow just with a community of just handfuls of people just developing these compiler tools. Right. And one of the reasons why they went with Swift is because Swift has a larger community of app developers. But what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically machine learning for science, right? So scientific machine learning. And there's a lot that we can benefit as scientists use, using Julia because Julia has such a large scientific community already. So what is scientific machine learning? So scientific machine learning is a core component of artificial intelligence and a computational technology that can be trained with scientific data to augment or, or automate human skills, right? That's the definition that the US Department of Energy gave when this, when this term was coined. And what it really means is that, you know, science has so much information in it that what, there are two things that we need to do. One thing that we need to do is we need to utilize everything that we know about science to make AI better. 
But the other thing that we need to do is, you know, if we, everyone help, everyone gets better when science advances. So how do we help the scientists work faster? Right. What is the machine learning for the scientist so that way we can discover new physics and so that way we can, you know, accelerate our computations so that way we can uh, even cre uh, run climate models in a way that is you know, more energy efficient. Right. How do we do all this with the amazing capabilities of artificial intelligence that have been developed over the last few years? So my claim is going to be that Julia's composable abstractions override any of these historical adv uh, advantages that Python or R, some of these older languages might have for scientific machine learning. Right? There, I'm gonna show you how there's some very, there's the ways that things have to interplay to be able to build a, a fully working scientific uh, computing ecosystem that is composable with machine learning libraries is going to have an advantage for Julia over even things that have had libraries built in the past. Now, why would that be the case? So basically where to start is to see that, you know, traditional deep learning learns everything from big data, right? So the way that you normally think about um, AI is you go, okay, there's, there's, I have my sets of billions of images, you know, I have every single image of dogs on the internet is billions and billions and billions of them. I'm going to just run this through my neural networks and I'm going to run this training mechanism. And if I train on enough data, this thing will work well. Well, that form of deep learning works really great for some problems, right? It works really great for learning language translation because there's just so much on the internet. It works great for some problems like image processing because there's just so many images on the internet. Now think about something like CERN though, right? The, the Large Hadron Collider was able to run a bunch of experiments, but doesn't, couldn't run millions of experiments, can't run billions of experiments. You know, you can't get that data to be able to train a gigantic neural network just by running the LHC as much as possible because it already costs billions, you know, what was it like $35 billion to be able to build that, the thing to be able to run as many experiments as it did. And so you can't just scale up your data generation for science. You know, you, you can't just build 10,000 Hubble telescopes be kept to be able to feed this data mechanism um, that traditional deep learning has been, right? So I'm, I'm calling it traditional deep learning because we're already 10 years since, uh, since ImageNet, right? So this has been now the way of the past. This is, we, we now need to start looking at problems where we can't just throw more data at the problem, right? And these problems where you can't throw more data at the problem is this big science. It's this expensive world where we can get 30 experiments and we need to learn how everything works from that. And how do we change the way that we're doing artificial intelligence so that way we can make use of it in this discipline, which you know, is required for climate modeling, for pharmacology, and all these areas where you, know, you, you can't just run, you, you can't run a clinical trial uh, to be able to get training data on a million people before you know whether a drug is gonna work, right? So how do you do this? And so what we really need to do is we need to not have the machine learning mechanism learn everything, right? It, it can't learn everything from data. We need to find some way to be able to put scientific knowledge into our machine learning. And what, what might that look like, right? So first let's try to figure out what scientific knowledge actually is so that way we can then change around our machine learning framework. So scientific knowledge is physical laws, right? So you can cite things like, you know, Einstein's equations or approximation of that being Newton's equations, right? You can, there's all these laws that we know about for how different biological organisms work. We know that protein X binds with protein Y. We know the canonical wind pathways. We know a lot of information about different scientific processes. And this is what we have, right? We, we all this scientific knowledge is in, you know, these laws that we know like the, the ideal gas law works, right? It's an approximation, but you know, that works as approximately to, you know, and as you get further and further in physics classes, you just learn more and more of these laws. And this is what we need to populate our artificial intelligence to start with. And the scientific knowledge, it, you know, it's not the way that you represent these laws is through models, right? So you have these models of how, you know, the climate works, models of how weather works. We have all these models of how, you know, on, on the right, I even show a biological signaling network. So, you know, we know a lot about how oh, the wind signal binds to the fizzle, which binds to beta care. You know, you, we have people have really mapped out how so many different scientific processes work. And these models for what is connecting to what, what never connects to each other, which chemicals interact, which chemicals can't interact, the, all these models for how different processes work is our combination of our scientific knowledge. 
And now the way that models become something that is predictive, right? The, the hard part in science is bringing these scientific models to mathematical equations. So you might know things like, you know, fluid dynamics or these physical phenomena are written down in terms of things like partial differential equations, where you can, you, you can know that, you know, this term is diffusion, this term is advection. So if I have, you, you know, I know that I can't lose mass when I'm, um, as, a, as a river's flowing. And so there has to be mass conservation laws inside of my equations. And you can prove that you need certain terms here and there and here and there. And then once you have these mathematical equations, you can sit down, you can write a computer that simulates them. And this gives us, you know, all these climate models. This gives us all of our pharmacology models. You might not know as much about biological modeling. So um, there's a lot of biological modeling, biopharma, biopharmacological modeling, uh, like it's shown on the top right, where it's um, the, these these equations are how the chemical reactions within biological organisms uh, interact, right? So you can take images of these, so you can tag things with GFP, like I show here, to be able to see which proteins localize and which ones don't localize. And so after hundreds of experiments that people do, like they gather all these images and you can put it together and you can find out, you know, this protein binds with this one, this one binds with this one, you know, so these things are interacting, these are not interacting. And you can build up these equations that are, are mimicking the chemical reactions within a bi biological organism. And then you can start to ask questions like if I was to reduce the rate of this reaction, you know, how would the brain develop differently? Would I be able to, you know, uh, would I be able to remove Alzheimer's without increasing with someone's blood pressure? All these things are now being able to be assessed by these equations that we're able to pull from thousands and thousands of experiments of, you know, taking these random pictures of different pieces of, you know, zebra fish brains and really pull this knowledge together. Right, so scientific knowledge, when we boil it down, has become all about these mathematical equations, right? Which is why, you know, someone like me in a mathematics department is looking at science through this lens. Now, machine learning, right? I, I mentioned that machine learning means billions and billions of data sets. And the interesting thing about science is that, you know, it, we don't have thousands of data sets. Machine learning runs on data, but what we have in science is a model and that itself is thousands of data sets, right? I, I, can't, I can't point to a single data set that I know of that proves that gravity is true. But you know that gravity exists and you know that you, there's an inverse square law and you know that you know, Einstein's relations hold. And why do we know this, right? We know this from observations of, um, observations of the orbit of Mercury, right? We know the, from the observations of our own solar system. We know it from the observations of galaxies, right? We know so many different little tiny experiments, like thousands and thousands of data sets build together this knowledge that we now know of as the gravitational laws that we can write down the equations for. So we don't have the data that we can feed into a neural network. We don't have, you know, a billion images or a billion rows that are all exactly the same, you know, with the same number of pixels and everything that's the strict requirements to be able to feed to neural networks. But what we do have is we do have an equation that is essentially the proxy for the thousands of experiments that allowed us to know that that equation is true. And so what we need to do is we need to utilize those mathematical equations as our basis to be able to do a machine learning with less or almost no data, right? So those scientific equations has to be what we're, what we're utilizing. And so can, how can we incorporate scientific models as prior knowledge into AI? Well, this is the act of scientific machine learning by utilizing these mathematical models as a form of data, as a form of prior knowledge. So in order to understand a little bit about why this works, right? So I'm not going to, this is not going to be like a very technical talk. I'm just going to, you know, kind of give a, a high level overview of how scientific machine learning works to be able to then start to focus on the software aspects of it. Um, but what I do want to understand or make sure everyone understands is why does machine learning work? And just enough to be able to understand how we can then augment it with science. So let's take one step back and just ask the question, why is machine learning working in the first place? So these prediction algorithms like neural networks are actually just functions, right? A neural network is just something that takes in, you know, if it has an in input layer of three, that just means it takes three, three input numbers and it spits out two numbers, right? If it's an image, it's going to be giving, you know, if it has like a yes, no for cat or dog, you know, then it's going to be giving you like a Boolean, yes, this is a cat, no, this is not a cat. Yes, this is a dog, no, this is not a, cat, a dog, right? In reality, all of that's really going on is it's something that takes in a whole bunch of numbers and it spits out a whole bunch of numbers. 
And so it's just a function, right? It's any function like you would have written down in a mathematics course when, you know, when you're in your fourth grade. And what you do with machine learning is you really just figure out there's just a bunch of little knobs in there. And you just have to figure out what, how to push these knobs around such that the inputs give you the outputs that you were expecting. That's really all that, the, that a neural network is. It is a function that has enough knobs in there. And the universal approximation theorem, right? This fancy thing that people have been able to prove is just that a neural network with enough layers, you know, deep enough, large enough, is able to approximate any function. So if you have a big enough neural network and if you have enough data, you can have that neural network do, uh, do any input to output behavior that you want. And so if you feed it, you know, if you use a really large neural network and you feed it a billion different images, you can make it so that way image one, it, it says dog, image one, image two says cat, image three says dog, right? And all you have to do is you have to just choose all the little knobs in there to be perfectly correct. And, you, and it will give you that output. And what this universal approximation theorem gives you is it says there exists a way to be able to tweak the knob such that that will be true, right? So this is really the key to machine learning. The fact that a neural network is something that is a universal function approximator. A neural network is something that can have any possible input output behavior. And that's why it's been so useful for data science. And so we can start to, if we understand machine learning from that standpoint, we can start to see how we can use it inside of physical equations, right? Because for example, in the Navier-Stokes equations I had written down here, there was an external force. And you might ask, well, what, what is the external force? Well, you know, if you're in a climate model, that external forcing could be due to things like uh, CO2 entering the, you know, uh, entering the atmosphere. It can be due to, you know, injecting something into a biological system. These, there are external forces that can happen and you might not actually know what that function is. You might not know all the terms of your equation. Another thing that can happen is you have an approximate model, right? Your, your model might not be, have all the details in there, like it's seen in you know, these epidemiological models for how COVID-19 is, is spreading. You know, if your model's incorrect, then there are some functions you might be missing. And you can always kind of figure out what those missing functions are. You can represent them with neural networks. So now you don't have, you know, you don't have a world of AI, which is doing image processing and in a world of science where you know gravity, right? Now you have gravity with missing terms like dark energy, where those can be represented and discovered with neural networks. And this is really what we're getting to with scientific machine learning. So this right here is the universal differential equation, which is augmenting these scientific models, these differential equations with universal pro function approximators. And this, this technique, it seems to be very powerful, right? It's only been going on for, you know, about a year now. But what we've, what we've been able to see, for example, is and colleagues of mine showed that you can, you know, you can take a state-of-the-art battery model. So one that's able to uh, figure out how, what the degradation is like of, the, of, um, of batteries. And you can take that, you can augment it with neural networks, you can use the, this on data. And then once you train the, these missing terms of your model, you can recover some missing chemical properties, some missing you know, unknown physics about how this battery is working and increase your prediction accuracy uh, by 19%. And what they're actually using this then for mm -hmm. is to be able to do battery powered cars and battery powered airplanes, right? So these fancy things like Teslas, you know, these things are going to be advanced by using scientific machine learning, you know, this, this connection between neural networks and scientific models slashed all, uh, smashed all together. And another thing that we're seeing is, you know, we, we can actually discover entirely new forms of physics. Like we can get rid of a physicist having to spend years and years of research by utilizing this technique. And so one of my students was actually looking at this problem of, you know, droplet physics. So you, basically this, this, the problem is, you know, when you, when you have a droplet, how exactly do things spread, right? This, this is really good to know for something like COVID-19 where, you know, these droplets are causing, you know, spread of moisture that could essentially be in, um, that could cause infections. So all these properties of like what, whether a math should work or not comes down to whether we know how droplet physics works. And surprisingly, this is not something that we know too much information about right now. And so what, what the student was doing was he was looking at, can we predict you know, these droplet crowns? Can we predict what, how the, what the different mass distribution is? Can we predict these different properties to understand how these droplets would, would move? And the, the real problem was that you know, there's one term in there that we didn't actually know, right? There, there's this crown height, which is, you know, we, we can measure a few things, 
but we can't actually get this crown thickness. But can we use some data to be able to figure out what this missing physics is? And if we can figure out these missing physical equations, then we can understand how to be able to utilize what, you know, the new physics of droplets to be able to develop you know, better masks. And so we can replace that, that missing term with the neural network and start to ask, if we were to put AI specifically into our physics here, can we then learn and recover you know, the missing physics and start to figure out what the equation should have been without having to derive theory? And so what was done was you know, this, this technique, which we call the universal differential equation, was used to train for this missing term. And in just one weekend, we're able to figure out, hey, this, you know, it was able to figure out that this term should have been this, this squared law. So it's this law of, you know, T to the three fifths over S squared. I'm gonna, not gonna mention what all these terms are because, you know, the, the, the actual physical equations are, are quite, you know, in depth, but really what, what it was able to do is able to find out that for the, if I make this neural network be, become the correct term in here, once it learns to be the correct term, then that correct term must be this physical law like here. And now you might mention, you might notice that, you know, the neural network is actually incorrect here, but the neural network was not incorrect here. Instead, what was incorrect was the theory. The theory, in order to actually do the derivation, are the, what, what Raj had to do was he had to make a few assumptions, you know, what happens when S is very, very small. And so the, those assumptions that were true when S is around one. And what, what this actually finds out is the neural network learns what the correct theory should be in, in the place where the, th where the theory was derived for, but then in the place where we can get measurements of the true droplet physics beyond where the theory is supposed to be predicting, then the neural network was able to predict a new theory, which we still don't know how to derive. And so, you know, this student was able to, you know, this, this really smart MIT student was able to essentially redo his two years of work in one weekend because he could take the equations that people knew, replace that missing term that he took two years deriving, um, and then just f discover it with the neural network. And that's really the key behind what, what's going on here, right? Mixing the two is now allowing very, you know, these physicists to be able to accelerate the way that they're working. And that itself means that we're accelerating the scientific discovery process. And so scientific machine learning can be used to learn missing physics, right? It can be, learned, be used to learn physics that we did not know about. But another way it's being used is it can approximate physics. It can find new ways to be able to speed up our computations by giving us cheaper ways to be able to simulate because we can have smaller models just be as, as accurate as the large one, as the full model. And one place where this is being used is in climate parameterizations. So climate models, you know, their, their starting point is this fluid dynamic uh, equation, which is this Navier-Stokes, this really large partial differential equation. And it's pretty much impossible to solve, you know, the Navier-Stokes on the, on the full earth. So no one even tries to do that. Instead, what people do is you try to you do these theoretical derivations where you say, you know, well, you know, if, if, you know, water doesn't really condense. So, you know, I make an assumption here, you know, if I assume that the temperature of the earth is always around 25 degrees Celsius. And if I assume, you know, you know, the gravity is the same all around the, you make a bunch of assumptions. And then you say, under these assumptions, then the, the temperature in the, in the Z axis going up and down on the ocean can be written down by this much simpler equation. And then this is the equation that people actually utilize in the climate model. And it works quite well, um, but there are a lot of inaccuracies that we know about that are introduced by this approximation process. And so there's, and there's actually, if you ask you know, a climate scientist about these equations, they can actually point to it and say, this term right here is the term that we have the most uncertainty from. Well, why not make, you know, if, if we know that this function, this one right here is incorrect, what happens if we replace that term with a neural network? and train that on the data that we have, right? Then it'll be something that will be, it will utilize all the knowledge of our theory, all the, uh, all the simplifications that we know we can do, but then it allows for a fudge term to say, you know, we know that we've, we've missed something, please neural network, please fix, you know, use this as your starting point and fix that final part of the equation for me. And this is what we're seeing gives you not only accelerated simulations, right? If we're not just using the accelerated form, but now we're able to make that accelerated form a lot more accurate. And this is how we're getting to this new generation of climate models like we're seeing built purely in Julia. Um, this, this Caltech and MIT is in this collaboration. And what we're really building it towards something that we can have much more quantified uncertainties and accelerated through this, this you know, connection between artificial intelligence and scientific modeling. 
And so if you want to find a, a lot more details about how you would do this, you know, if, if you're interested in the mathematics and the science and the computation there, I have a few talks very recent on YouTube and they all go into explicit in, you know, they go and go into detail. In fact, one of them is a four hour workshop about how you, how you actually program these things, uh, full live coding. So if you want to know all the details about how to do this, um, go check out the workshop. But what I want to do instead is I want to really describe how the, the software was actually built. I want to, you know, dev to dev, I want to give you a talk about why this was built in Julia instead of trying to do this in Python. And I will say right now, I could not have done this in Python. So for these techniques to work, scientific simulation and machine learning need to talk the same language. Right? You can't have TensorFlow works over here and you can't have Python works over here and you know one person does something and then another person's working in TensorFlow. Now we're talking about this problem where the climate model actually needs to have the neural network inside of it. Now we're talking about this problem where the pharmacological model or the biosimulator needs to have neural networks in there. So they need to be in, in speaking the same language. It needs to all work together, right? And you might think that might work in, uh, directly in Python, but here's the issue, right? The, the real issue is that TensorFlow is not Python. It looks a lot like Python. You program TensorFlow inside of Python, but TensorFlow is not Python, right? So it, when you look at TensorFlow variables, it says tf.variable, right? So whenever you see that, you should know that you're, you're defining a TensorFlow variable, which is not a Python variable, right? You're, you're defining TensorFlow constants, which are not which are not Python constants. You're, you're, you're evaluating in, in the TensorFlow graph, which is, not the tensor, which is not the Python language, right? And so you can't just take an existing, you know, if you look at a Python code and you look, if you had a full climate model written in Python, that is not a TensorFlow code. So you cannot put a, a TensorFlow neural network in there. They are two completely different things because they're, it's not the same language, right? So TensorFlow is a language that you program from Python, but it is not Python itself. And so you cannot take an existing scientific code and just throw a neural network in there and expect TensorFlow to work on it. That means that we might have, if we want to use TensorFlow, we need to rewrite all of our simulators, you know, things that people have been working on for 20 years into TensorFlow. And PyTorch is also not Python. So PyTorch gets pretty close, but there's a lot of cases where you can point at. You know, there's a, when when people are taught PyTorch, right? They're taught all of these very interesting details about where everything is different, right? So, um, for example, transpose has different syntax between the two. Sometimes they match the same syntax, right? So a a, a numpy array dot sum has the same syntax as a tensor dot sum from PyTorch but they actually don't compute the same thing, right? They, they're, they're computing the sum differently. And if you know that your, your, your floating point operations are not um, associative, you'll get, a different, uh, no, you'll get a different answer from the sum in NumPy than PyTorch and your, your errors will be different. Um, sometimes when you, you know, some of these values, you know, you might have a sum, well, the sum in NumPy will turn, return a number, whereas a, a, a sum in PyTorch will return a one by one array. Right, so there, there's all these semantic differences, and so if you try to put a ten, a PyTorch neural network inside of an existing Python code, you know, even if it's using things like NumPy, very standard tools, it won't just work. And in fact, it not only will it not just work, but PyTorch doesn't even implement the full NumPy. Right, there are there are some operations like determinant which are not natively supported yet. So it's not the same, like it, it's close, but it's not the same language. And it means that any time that you want to be able to take a scientific code and be able to use neural networks inside of it, you need to rewrite it, right? You, you basically need to start from scratch. And so the, if we're thinking about scientific machine learning, this connection, we really can only use the codes which are already pre-built to be able to utilize neural networks inside of them, which is not the, the millions of packages in the scientific ecosystem. It's the very few packages that people have written for, for, for TensorFlow or PyTorch. And it's the even smaller bit of them, which are were not for machine learning, but for scientific uh, models instead. And so the difference is, can be subtle, right? It, it can be a matter of correctness and performance. Right, so they ha the Python is an imperative language. TensorFlow is a de declarative language. So they have different language semantics. Um, 
In one, you can control memory representations. In another, it takes it for you and it distributes things for you. And you know the sums can be in different orders, so they can compute different values. This is something that you have to be very careful about. So you can't just take an existing code, expect this to happen, because they are, you know, if, if you put the numbers in there, you'll see that you get different values. And if you try to just slam things together, you'll get these compiler errors. And so this is this is a really a key key issue. If you can't just reuse your existing package, then we're losing one of the, the main things that we had before with Python, right? And so one, one of Python's advantages was its packages. But if you can't just take someone's existing work and throw a neural network on there, then we lose one of those main advantages. And when, what we need to start asking then is, where can we have someone who is working on the scientific model build a scientific model and have me come on along and put a neural network inside of there without ever having to communicate, right? Because we want to be able to reuse each other's work. We want to be able to, you know, have just one ecosystem where we can start to be able to, you know, have people modeling and people doing artificial intelligence and slam things together and not have to worry about rewriting other people's code bases. And so because we can't just reuse all these Python, this old Python software, I think it gives us a good reason to reevaluate our choice of language. Right. We, we, if, we, if, we, if some people are going to have to start from scratch anyways, what is the least from scratch we can do? Or what is the most advantage we can get um, in, this, in this area? And so one option that you can go with is you can create a domain-specific language. Right. So a domain-specific language is something like here, uh, here Diftachi is a, is a really great one. It is, a, it is a differentiable programming language for physical simulation. So they're, they're writing a, a language which has sem semantics very similar to, Py uh, to Python um, that compiles in specific ways. Right? So they wrote their own, uh, they, they, matched, they got pretty close to Python in the syntax. They wrote their own compiler. And if, you, if, you're, if your problem fits into their, their system, then it, is, you know, it can work pretty well. And you can do a lot of physical simulations with you know, differentiable programming, which is required for neural networks in there. You can do a lot of that with, uh, with Diftachi on the, on the types of problems they've demonstrated. So you have full control if you want to have a domain specific language. But if you have a domain specific language, that means you have to write everything yourself, right? So you can have your domain specific language for robotics and you can have your language for uh, geosciences. You can have your language for biosciences and then everyone can just rewrite full compilers from scratch. Everyone can just rewrite, you know, every single library for linear algebra from scratch. And, you know, you, you could probably see that, you know, that, that, that has its own advantages, but it doesn't it doesn't really solve the problem that I'm looking at, right? It doesn't solve this problem of, I just want to reuse people's software in a, in a way to do scientific machine learning and going to, you know, these sub domain specific languages doesn't really capture that, that difficulty. It doesn't really solve that problem. And so can we make a language that, with, that doesn't have a barrier between the way it does machine learning and the way that other software works, right? That language exists and it's called Julia and there's already thousands of scientific simulators you can use with machine learning. And this is, this is really why uh, Julia is, comes into the play. So, you know, why is Julia, why Julia? What is Julia? So Julia is this language which is very expressive, right? So you can take a textbook algorithm, you can implement it in Julia that utilizes the same symbols as all of the textbook algorithm, right? It can look almost exactly like what, what you would find when you, when you learn the problem. And then you can have your simulator work in a way that looks a lot like the mathematics. And so this, for example, um, is looking at a Gillespie simulation. These are things that we use inside of um, the quantitative systems pharmacology for mo model informed um, drug development and, and, these other, and these other aspects, right? So th this is real model code that looks almost exactly like the mathematical model, which makes it easy for a mathematician to just kind of play around with it and modify it. So this is one of the reasons why people have used Julia. And one of the other main reasons why people use Julia is because it's fast, right? I don't mean it's just a little fast. I mean that it's able to essentially get to what uh, C++ is able to do, right? And, and so what, what we see in this case is that, you know, you can, you can use a, a pack, if you were to write this whole Gillespie simulation yourself in R, it can take 785 milliseconds. If you use, utilize one of the R packages, it can take 463 uh, milliseconds. If you utilize differential equations at GL, you get down to one millisecond. That package is completely written in Julia. 
right? So, and so you, and you can actually sit down and say, for this exact problem, I'm not gonna use the package, I'm going to, I'm gonna optimize exactly the, the simulation code for this problem, and you can get this down to 0 0.5 seconds. So 650 times faster than R. This is using an interactive language, right? This is interactive like Python or R, but you're getting these humongous speed ups with syntax and style that looks like the, the actual math. And this is one of the main reasons why people had adopted Julia in the past. And one of these other advantages then is because Julia is fast enough and is very expressive, you have these entire packages, like I mentioned, differential equations.jl. Flux.jl is another one that, which is written entirely in Julia, right? So you have this 100% um, on, on the GitHub that says, oh, this is, this is a Julia package, right? It can be hard sometimes to actually figure out what's a Python package, because if you look at, you know, TensorFlow on, on, on GitHub, you'll see that it is, you know, mostly not Python code. Um, even PyTorch, even though it is, you know, it, it's, its largest amount is Python code, it's still majority not Python code. Right? And this means that you, you have a lot of issues getting and keeping developers, right? So, um, all right, so one of, one of these other reasons for why Julia is that it's easier to get de people developing because if you know how to use the language, then you know how to develop for the language. So uh, what people talk about in this space is the truck factor, right? Um, it's how many people would have to get hit by a truck such that the, the, um, the project would stop. And it's, you know, if, if you aren't in the open source community, the numbers are a lot smaller than you think it might be, right? So for example, something like Pandas um, has essentially two developers uh, at a time. It's, it had one developer, that, uh, another developer who used to be working on it that doesn't work on it as much, and has had a new one then kind of join in as well. But it has a, you know, it has a truck factor of two. So if, if you lost those two people, the, the project is done. Um, TensorFlow, it, according to, to these resources uh, that have measured the truck factors, has two people essentially were, uh, who know the software well enough to be able to really keep the whole thing running. Um, that these truck factors tend to be quite low and they, they're especially low in languages where the way that people build packages is not by writing in the same language, but writing in a separate language, right? So TensorFlow is implemented mostly in C++. So most of the people who use TensorFlow wouldn't know how to develop it because it is in a different language than the one, the one that they've learned. If you look at the truck factors for Julia packages or even the Julia programming language itself, right? So languages are hard to write, compilers are hard to write, but even then it has a truck factor that is a lot larger than a lot of widely used Julia packages or than a lot of Python packages simply because it is written mostly in Julia. And so if you know how to write Julia, you know, if you can write fast Julia code, which, hey, Julia is fast by default, then you know how to write Julia packages and you know how to write Julia itself because it is something that is written in Julia, right? So, so why, why Julia? Well, you, you, having everything in one language is really about productivity, building a larger developer base. And this is actually one of the advantages that we're able to get. And it's why Julia is growing so fast, right? Because everyone who uses the language can also be a, a package developer. And now the key then that gets us to scientific machine learning is this last one. And it's that Julia is composable, right? So. Here, what I'm showing is there's an ODE library, you know, differential equations defines ordinary differential equations. And then there's a neural network library, Flux. And so now we want to put neural networks inside of differential equations. What we do is we define a neural network with the neural network library. We define an ODE, an, uh, an ordinary differential equation with the differential equation library. And we just put the two together and it works. Right, so so you, you probably might have heard about you know this 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 uh, very cool new ma uh, machine learning uh, um, methodology called neural ODEs, right? That came out just a few years ago. The neural ODE library in Julia is just the network neural network library and the ODE library used at the same time. And so you know if we, there's a lot of things that are modeled through ODEs. There's combustion modeling, you know that it, that is done with uh, differential equations. Well, that uses differential equations such yeah, It uses this package, you know, pharmacometric modeling um, and, and modeling of quantitative system pharmacology that uses differential equations such yeah. Climate models use differential equations such yeah. Robotics models use differential equations such yeah. All these things are using this one package which is already able to be used with neural networks. And so that whole thing that I just mentioned about, hey, we might want to stick the two together. You don't actually have to write new code to do this. If someone has already written quantum dynamics with simulations, if someone's already written battery simulations, then you could just take that battery simulation, 
plug a neural network into there. And because of the composability of Julia, now you have a battery, you know, now you have a battery model, which is integrating neural networks to be able to do state of the art scientific machine learning. This is something that we're talking about five lines of code, 10 lines of code to be able to start doing these state of the art investigations. Um, just by putting two things together, right? That's what composability means. It means take A, take B, now you have A plus B. Putting things together is actually a very strong part of the Julia programming language. And when composability goes long or wrong, you lose the advantage of high level languages in package ecosystems, right? So Python has had a lot of really good work done to it, but when you don't have this composability, then you lose a lot of that advantage. So for example, um, if, you, if you look at something like uh, differential equations.jl, right? So diff uh, what composability lets you do is you can take this differential equation library and utilize it with neural networks in a way that someone does not have to rewrite a new differential equation library in PyTorch, right? Why, why, would, why would you want to do that? Well, because dense dif differential equations.jl, we've optimized it for many, many years now with people who, whose expertise is actually in just solving this exact equation, right? There are people who, who like me, who have studied for years and years and years just how to solve this equation very, very fast. And so we've been able to show that we can get you know, 50 times faster than SciPy, 50 times faster than MATLAB, 100 times faster than, uh, D, and than RSD solve library. And these are actually calling Fortran uh, code underneath the hood too. Right? So, so th there's a lot of very deep si uh, mathematics and science that you can do to make these differential equation solvers really fast. And we don't need to have to try to replicate it in a, new, in a new framework, in a new machine learning framework every few years, right? Because we've been able to just write this library, be able to optimize this library, and be able to really hyper-optimize this library and utilize the neural network inside of there without having to rewrite it. So composability lets an, an expert work on their expertise, let someone else work on their expertise, and now A plus B works together, and now you get the, the, you get the sum of the parts, it, or, it, which is essentially is more than the sum of the parts, because you get the speed of the two people um, having optimized their, their scientific domain. And so what we've actually seen with this is that, you know, the, the, when the neurology paper came out in, with PyTorch, right, this, this is uh, 2019, there was a lot of these extra features that we have in these differential equation libraries, like solving stiff equations, handling, of, handling discontinuous events, all these extra features weren't there, right, because they had to write a, a new one from scratch in PyTorch. And that one that they wrote in PyTorch, it wasn't as optimized as the Fortran code that people have been working on for years because it was one developer who, you know, was working on this to try, try to get this paper done. And, you know, it was 450 times slower than SciPy on this example that we show here. And that means that it was 30,000 times uh, slower than, than uh, Julia, right? So th this, is, this is not a small difference. You know, compo what composability lets us do is we can take this heavily optimized code and if you don't use this heavily optimized code, then you're either trying to redo this from scratch or you're taking some shortcuts. So that way it's not fully optimized. And this, this, this difference can, can grow even as the subject expertise that's required grows, right? So we get into a more obscure topic, you know, stochastic differential equations. So there's this Torch SDE that came out um, just actually just a few weeks ago where, you know, they, they've written a stochastic differential equation solver, which is kind of a niche uh, field of differential equations. And if you take the README, you take the README example, and you take the, the documentation example in Julia, you'll see that the README example was 76,000 times slower than the, than the package in Julia. But the, the, the new one is able, you know, Torch SDE can, works with PyTorch, so that's the advantage. Um, but the, the Julia one also works with neural networks because no one even had to make it work with neural networks to, 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 for that to work, right? And, and so this composability is, is this huge strength. Actually, this one is kind of interesting as well because right before this talk, um, the the uh, the authors of this Torch SD library told me that they've actually improved the benchmarks, right? So it no longer takes a thousand seconds for the for the um, for Torch SD to run these this example. It now it goes to five seconds, and so you know these these uh, Google engineers have now been working for weeks to get to a point where it it is essentially running a whole bunch of highly optimized C code to be only five hundred times slower than the Julia library. Whereas this Julia library for, for solving these stochastic differential equations is something that I wrote in 2016 as part of a PhD project. And it just exists as something that is fast because it's in Julia. And it just exists as something that it can use in neural networks because of this composability. So, I mean, th this, is, this is a huge comparative advantage for me as like a mathematician scientist, you know, to just be able to reuse these old codes in a way that is still optimized. And so, 
the other thing that's going on, right, is, you know, you, you might have noticed that in, in Python, you don't just have one machine learning framework, you have new ones coming out all the time, right? So, you know, you, you, some of us remember Theanos and Theanos went to, to TensorFlow and then TensorFlow went to PyTorch. And now some people are talking about JAX, right? And so if you want to do machine learning inside of neural networks or neural networks inside of differential equations, well, now you're gonna have to rewrite a new one in JAX, right? And so how's that going along? Well, you know, there's a PhD student at Northeastern just 19 days ago who, implement, who tried to implement a version of one of these uh, stiff OD solvers and where they're at right now is they're about 200 times slower than uh, VODE when you're utilizing the JIT compiler from uh, JAX against just the Python code, right? So 200 times slower than SciPy. But remember, like our library was already in Julia was already 50 times faster than SciPy. So we're talking about you know thousand you know three orders of magnitude um, difference here. And you, you know, so this student is just trying to do some work in, try, in trying to get into this discipline of scientific machine learning. And to get there, he needs to start from scratch and write these differential equation solvers into these machine learning libraries. And there's just this huge burden of having to rewrite so much software to even just be able to get to their research. And so, you know, in, in, every time a new machine learning framework comes out, this work needs to be redone. And that's, that's the cost of non-composability. And so composability, really just means that we're accruing developer time and resources, right? So the differential equation library in Julia that we're now using for, you know, this, this scientific machine learning and, and you know, this, these, these, uh, this research, it started in 2016. We're still using the same code from there. You know, the, these new, you know, you, you think of Python as having these packages since forever, but these packages that are doing these, this neural network infused uh, differential equations, they're from 2019, the, the code's from 2020. You know, we've had over 50 developers that have highly optimized different aspects of our code, whereas these are just brand new pieces of code put out by one people or, you know, like oh, one lab, you know, like a PhD student advisor and maybe like a trainee student, right? And what, what do the developer practices mean? Well, we've been able to, to develop, you know, this, this continuous integration system, where if you look at our SciML ecosystem, we have hundreds of hours of continuous integration that would be run if you're to chain different aspects of uh, this ecosystem. A lot of these actually don't even have continuous integration set up yet because they're, they're brand new, right? They're, they're, these, these are things that are, are not really matured yet. Um, and so a lot of them are even missing things that you might want, like Windows support, right? Like, does it work on Windows? Some of these libraries don't, right? Even the whole JAX machine learning library doesn't work on Windows yet. So, you know, all this stuff that takes developer time and resources, every single time you have this new machine learning framework that you want to do scientific machine learning in, you have to start from scratch and get all of those features again. And composability, you know, really lets you build feature support, right? Because you're not wonder, you're not trying to rebuild the same basic ODE software every single time. You're not trying to redo window support in every single new framework. What you do is you, you get that once, you work on the next problem, you work on the next problem, and you build a whole ecosystem of things that solve a much more difficult problem because it, it builds over time. And so there's all these features that we can point at. Like a lot, some of it's technical, so I'm not going to go into all the details here. But things like stiff ODEs and differential algebraic equations, um, and adjoint methods. You know, these these stabilized adjoint methods, right? So there's stabilization, which which is required that you know you can find in these old C++ libraries. We've made sure in the five years of you know almost five years now of uh, SciML development that we've been able to get them in the Julia ones. They're there the in 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 the Python libraries, right? They'll get there. They'll just require that a lot of people put a lot of time and work in to get there, right? Um, you know, the parallelism, what kind of parallelism exists? Can you use a whole cluster of millions of cores? You know, uh, uh, Vera was just talking about how this is something that we have in Julia, right? This, this form of parallelism. So we make use of it. And some of these machine learning libraries haven't tried to do this with the neural network library, with the neural ODE library yet, because it's just, you know, they haven't gotten to that scale yet. They don't have enough developer resources. And, and a lot of these little, these issues that you'd associate with an immature package ecosystem, which sounds weird, right? Because you think of Python as having a very mature ecosystem, but the, the thing is that you, if you can't reuse all of your existing technology from before because of this lack of composability and you have to keep on starting from scratch, then you do end up with something that is immature in some of these, you know, ecos in some of these aspects because you can't leverage all that work that you've done. And so is this subverting your expectations about the Python ecosystem? Yeah, probably it should be because you, pr you think, you know, Python is very mature. 
in a lot of its aspects and a lot of this, you know, these web development and things like that. But if you can't just take the existing package and use it in this discipline, then you're at step one again. And so composability is really the thing then that allows us to be able to drive forward with Julia because we can use all this code that people have built in the last 10 years of Julia, right? It's only been around for 10 years. So you might say Python's been here longer, but everything that we have built can be used in all of our machine learning frameworks. And so when machine learning framework five comes around and people are having to rebuild things in Python once again, we still have, we, we, it just compounds the advantage that we get to have in Julia. And so uh, it's, it's just, to just to take a case study of, of how this is going on, right? So, you know, we're looking at reaction combustion. We're very interested in some of these reaction combustion problems, be able to figure out how to do more efficient jet engine development, right? Uh, one of the things that you can use is catalyst.jl. So catalyst.jl was actually built for biological simulations, but they have its, it's biological simulations are also for chemical reaction system networks. Um, it has been for developers. One of them has been me since 2017. And it, because it uses differential, it, it builds differential equation code, then um, it's compatible with the neural network libraries and it can do Bayesian estimation, sparsity support, neural, and it composes with neural networks, right? Um, there's another one that's come up, a reaction mechanism simulator built by one of these MIT PhD students. He's been working on it for about a year now, or two, two major developers there, and also has Bayesian, uh, Bayesian neural network support and sparsity handling, and you know these stabilized adjoints, because it's just using the tools that exist in the Julia ecosystem and putting its reaction mechanism, its cat reaction combustion um, components on top of it, right? There, there, there is a, a library for doing this in, in, in uh, PyTorch, it started in May at three major developers. Those actually, those major developers now have actually started using Julia instead, though. Um, and there's there's one that started in uh, Jax uh, in Jax as well, right? So this Jax reactor library. It has one developer, and that developer is actually the same person who I showed earlier put in the in the pull request to be able to add stiff OD support to to Jax. Right, so he essentially he he seems like a, a very great developer. I looked at some of the code, you know, fantastic work. Um, but in order to actually do what he wants to do with Jax, he needs to start from scratch and write everything from the ground up. Whereas what these other developers have been able to do is you just say, hey, look, there's this existing biological simulation library. No one has thought to put a neural network in there. Boom, those things together is a library I can use for this research. And so it's this, this advantage that you can get in, in these scientific disciplines is pretty magnificent once you look at how to do this composability. And composability is really, you know, one of these other things that you get from it is you get a corpus of, you know, documentation, tutorials, uh, teaching resources that builds up over time, right? The, the, the things of a um, mature ecosystem you get from composability because you aren't restarting new libraries every few years. You, you know, so the differential equation library has been around for four and a half years, almost five years now. And there's four online workshops because I've been doing one per year. Right. Um, there's 26 tutorials with you know how to for how to find uh, missing physics and do Bayesian estimation. And there's all this stuff for doing automated discovery of phys uh, physical equations that has all been able to build up because we've never had to throw anything away. Instead, what happens is you get new, you know, we got GPU support because someone added GPU support to the Julia programming language and now boom, now we have GPU support. Someone added neural networks to the Julia programming language and boom, now this is all together, right? We've just been able to build on our path and just work on one problem. And by working on just this one problem, we get something that's able to work on the combination of all problems because other people have been working on those. And so now we, now we actually end up in this, this interesting spot where it's actually kind of hard to document all the things that we can do because you can come up with a combination of something we've never tried. And that is a, that would be in another language, that would be a new library to write. But in Julia, that's just a documentation example we haven't written down yet. And so there's a lot of scientific machine learning opportunities that are just ready here in Julia, right? So the Klima climate model, uh, we, MIT and Caltech has been building it. Our, our next step is just to add neural networks to it. You know, we've been doing pharmacological modeling and robotic simulation. These things are ready to be do new scientific machine learning. We don't just, you can pick them up and start to work with it. Um, and so we, 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 you know, one of the things that we've been working on for now three years is to get this FDA validated pharmacometric software um, that can run really fast. And in the last year since scientific machine learning has come around, now it's a SIML enhanced one, right? And this is, this is actually something where people are still using Fortran codes. People haven't even gotten to write, really rewriting this kind of software in any other high level uh, programming language. So 
Um, th this is actually a, a huge area for us to be able to do a lot of interesting research and uh, drug development in that you really won't find anywhere else. And so it also means, so with the differential equation library, right, you, you want to have GPUs working on your neural networks inside of your differential equations. And be, this just comes from composability. We didn't actually have to do anything for, for this to work. And so what composability means is that you have the whole language and all of its developers at its, as its tool, right? You, you don't have your camp of, you know, the, the, these people are the packages that I work with, or these, this group is the group that, that is going to work for me, right? You have anyone who works in parallelism in Julia gives me a new feature. Every single time they, they add one, I have a new feature. So it's, it's actually hard for me to kind of keep up with documentation with all the features that just kind of exist out of composability. And so what we, what we have now is we have this scientific machine learning ecosystem, which a lot of it is, it's the differential equation solvers for doing the scientific modeling. A lot of these modeling toolkits, right, for, for you know, easily doing combustion modeling, easily doing uh, building energy simulations, easily doing robotics. Um, and then the feature, the, these libraries that do scientific machine learning, like DiffieQ Flux and Neural PDE, these, libra these libraries, which are now becoming very popular, they actually don't really have much code at all. They're like 200 lines of code with a whole bunch of tutorials just showing you how to slap together a bunch of libraries because we need a, put, a place to put the documentation for how to do this thing that exists by itself because multiple dispatch has created this feature. And so my conclusion then is that composability is Julia's technical advantage, right? We don't have the, the years and years that, that something like Python or R has, but with scientific machine learning, we need to be able to, to start to compose together software. And once you end up with this problem, then having a historical advantage doesn't really matter anymore. What matters now is how many things are compatible with the code I want to write today. And if, you, if everyone, if the only code that you can work with is code that is written in TensorFlow, or if the only code that you can work with is code written in PyTorch, you now no longer have that advantage in, with Python. And so with the Julia programming ecosystem, you know, we've been able to do things that look absolutely fantastic, right? We, with what looks like less developers than, than Python. It actually isn't much less developers because Julia is written in Julia, right? So we have that advantage that so many people are developing in Julia. You know, a high percentage of people are working in Julia. And then also every single thing that someone else does helps you, you know? So in the end, you don't have to wait for TensorFlow to implement a new, um, a new feature. You don't have to wait for PyTorch to implement a new feature. You don't even have to wait for Julia to implement a new feature. You can change the compiler yourself as a user of building a package in the ecosystem. And then that person who's built a change of feature in the compiler with their package, now you can utilize that in your package. And the two of them together is, is something that to write home about. And so this composability really gives us a, a real technical advantage. And it's been really interesting to work with the Julia programming language because of this, you know, because of the features that we've gotten for free. A lot of times people have messaged me asking me whether a feature exists. And um, sometimes people would message me, like telling me that a feature exists in my library that I did not know about. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. I, this should subvert your expectations a little bit, but hopefully understanding this composability at this level makes you really see how new programming language can really push us forward. Thank you uh, for an amazing talk. Uh, there are lots of questions by our audience. Uh, I wanted to start on a personal note. I was really blown away by the from the first minute uh, when you made uh, big data seem so small compared with a good model. Uh, nowadays, it seems like every problem is a big data problem. And now I, I, I really changed my mind. And I think um, I'm reminded of the quote by Carl Sagan, who said, if you want to build, make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And it seems <laughs> like you can like uh, plug the entire universe into your um, into your code and then start computing. And then uh, the data is much uh, richer. And uh, just just big data now seems like uh, it's it's really nothing at all compared to a good model and some data. Um, well, let, let me, so I think that you know there are problems that are solved by big data. And um, actually, I, I like the analogy back to uh, genomics, right? So um, in, in the 1990s, when the Human Genome Project was going through, like Eric Lander was, ran this, this huge project to, to sequence the human genome. And a lot of people were thinking that most major diseases would be solved by knowing the genome. You know, it was solved, it, it, you still can get diseases, right? So that, that didn't happen. What went wrong? Well, the problem is that most 
diseases aren't due to one gene, right? There are some diseases where you, you can know, like if you have this, uh, if you have a SNP, if you have a single nucleotide poly polymorphism in this gene, then you'll have Huntington's disease, right? And so those diseases are the diseases that we're able to target, we're able to build drugs for, and we're able to build a lot of nice things for to be able to solve those problems. The diseases which weren't single, single gene diseases are the things that we're now working on, right? In, in some sense, that's what's happening now with AI and machine learning. Right, the problems which were big data machine learning problems, the things like natural language processing and image processing, those are now solved by big data. I'm not, I'm not looking at those, right? But there's so many problems in science where we can't big, get big data. Those are now the problems to look at, right? This is the future of what we want to look at with, with AI and machine learning. We have to change how we're doing this. Right. I'm going to dive into uh, some questions by the audience. Um, one of them, I think, uh, it might be uh, a question many have. Uh, which is about um, composability. Like, can you explain a bit more about how it works? Yeah, so uh, essentially the way that this composability works is through, so, so Julia itself, the, way, the reason why it's fast is it has this, this abstract syntax tree, um, which is very simple, right? So it has this abstract syntax tree where it's able to do type inference on. So what, what that means is that it's able to figure out um, and do these computations of if I have this type here, then I'll have this type here, then I have this type here. And so that was implemented to make Julia fast, right? It was implemented so that way it can have, you can write something a lot like Python, but then it's able to infer what the C code you would have wanted to write was. And the Julia compiler basically has a step of take the Julia code you wrote, automatically augment it with all these type, this type information, and then send it through LLVM, right? So this is why Julia's fast. Well, it, it turns out that if you constrain your language in a way such that type inference works. So Julia does have some features that were, uh, there are basically some things that you can't do in Python or that you can do in Python that you can't do in Julia. For example, you can't, after you define a struct, you can't add new fields to it. Um, because if you could do that, then you would never know what the memory layout of your struct were. Right? There, there are certain features like this that exist in the Python language that make it very hard to reason about. And the Julia programming language is, specifically a lot like a high level programming language that you would know from before. And it chooses to not have, allow those features that make it hard to really be able to, to um, do the analysis on and therefore it's able to be fast. But what we found is that if you, by making that decision, right? By making those decisions of, to make it very easy to analyze a program then it makes it easy to do composability in other ways, right? Because if it's easy to analyze a program to make it fast, then it's easy to analyze a program to take it and not compile it for your CPU, but compile it to the GPU. Then it's easy to automatically look at a program and say, this is the program, the, what is the der derivative version of the program, right? A lot of what these machine learning frameworks are actually doing, like TensorFlow, is it's a separate language from Python because it needed to be a bit simpler to be able to do these, this type of analysis on it. But Julia itself is a full programming language, which is simple enough to be able to do this analysis, but expressive enough to be a high level programming language. And then that's what gives us this composability, that, that simplicity um, that is there for people who want to be able to write compiler optimizations to be able to change other people's code. Great, our next questions are more on the application side. Um, there's a question by Mariana Vignolas, who says she's a fan of your work and she's in the pharmaceutical industry. And her question is, um, do you think that CIML like Pumas uh, will be accepted by FDA and or e EMA in new drugs trials and thus shorten the time and money spent in phases one and two? We are testing this out, actually. Um, I can't give all the details right now, but we are actually being, we are showcasing that this will work in a real clinical trial. Um, and so there, there's, a, there's a few ways that, that, there's actually more than one project that we're doing that on. So hopefully, you know, hopefully a year or two from now, I'll be able to actually prove that, that this will work in pharmacology by showing you a drug that's been done with this. Amazing. Okay, so next question. Um, Ivan Mindlin says, in your opinion, why aren't we all using SciML? What is the step we need as a scientific technical community to embrace this new approach? And Julia brings a beautiful solution, but is it enough? Yeah, so, um, so why aren't we all using it? It's, I mean, 
the reason why we aren't using it is because you need all the software for scientific computing, you know, like these full climate models and everything, and you need a full software stack for machine learning. So this is this is something where we needed to go as a scientific community. We needed to go through the maturity of you know hundreds of years of differential equation solver work, and then the, all the all these years recently of deep learning. Right? We needed to understand both these disciplines to really know how to use them together effectively and have software ecosystems that can work for it. I think one of the reasons why it hasn't been done you know too much in the past is just that it's been software hard to do this. Right? So the people who I mean the people who demonstrated neural ODs had to write a neural network compatible ODE library in PyTorch to be able to do their research, right? Um, and, and so, like, th th there was this there's this disadvantage where you you know it just you had to do a whole lot of work. You had to know enough about numerical differential equations to actually be able to you know build the library to be able to solve these equations before you built up the model of those equations before you could even you know. And then you have to know enough about machine learning. Like, there's just so much you had to know to do it in the past. But now I think we've really hit, you know, we've got the activation energy, we, we've gone over it now. Now we can, you know, we can, I, I teach a course at MIT where we're getting undergraduates to be able to start doing machine, scientific machine learning and be able to get paper worthy, you know, publication worthy results in just a few months. And so now that we're at this level, yeah, now I think that, I, I think that people are just going to start doing a lot more of it. Um, we're just really at the beginning. And is Julia enough for that? Well, there's always more that you, there's always more that you can add. I think that um, there's more compiler op opportunities that we need to be working with. Um, one of the difficulties with the Julia programming language so far in scientific machine learning is that the spot at which a lot of these composability tools works fairly early. It works before the compiler optimizations. So Julia itself will be um, will be changing to be able to to allow for more scientific uh, machine learning tools to be able to be more optimized by allowing us to hit you know to hit and modify other people's Julia code after the Julia optimizer has ran. And there's some advantages that we know about that, that we can get from that. And so there are some there are some things that we're, we're working on. I think that the current Julia is able to show quite a quite a quite a amazing amount of, of things, but um, I think that where we'll be in two years will actually be something where we can start to, you know, really say that scientific machine learning is something everyone should do from the first day they step into undergraduate. Yeah. Thank you. And Vit Obrusnik says, uh, thinking about uh, control systems uh, like Simulink on MATLAB, uh, he asks if there is any plan to add something like that, something like a more graphical interface to Julia. Yeah, I, I think that the, the question instead, um, I, I'd rephrase it differently, which of these uh, Simulink like libraries in Julia do you want to use, right? Because Julia has a lot of mature uh, libraries. One of the ones that I think is really nice is uh, JUDSL. Um, they, uh, the developer gave a talk at JuliaCon today. So you can go look at their video, you can go look at that package. That's a very nice uh, Simulink like package. It's only like Simulink because um, it, you know, it has the same ODE part of, of Simulink, but it also adds new features like uh, stochastic differential equations, delay differential equations, differential algebraic equations, GPU compatibility, these kinds of things that you don't find in Simulink. Um, it's really been what the focus of JUDSL has been to be able to really extend this form of modeling. Um, uh, another one that I like is uh, networkdynamics.jl. I know that a lot of people at NREL, uh, so some of these national labs for, um, for modeling uh, power grids have been building this up. That's a very nice system for that as well. Um, we've been working on another one. So uh, modelingtoolkit.jl is, is essentially a, a Modelica-like system. So it has simulating -like components for um, doing causal modeling, but then it also has, it also allows you to just make equality relationships like in a circuit, just say like, you know, the voltage here equals the voltage here. And so that's called an A-causal model. And then it can develop and, and solve the differential algebraic equations from the A-causal models. What people haven't been done as much in the Julia ecosystem is really the, the graphic user, graphical user interfaces. Um, Simulink has a great, G, has a great GUI. Um, what people have been working on right now a lot in Julia is really what are the computational problems that we can solve and how can we can make it faster. And so people have just been, you know, really busy, like, you know, you, you get surprisingly busy just like working on features that you never thought about, right? The developers of um, JDSL thought they were going to be building a, a Simulink like system, right? So they, they did the computational back end. You can do the simulations part of it. They never got around to the GUI because they realized they can start doing stochastic differential equations, which has opened up its own whole, wow, we didn't know we can do these models. And so they've gotten stuck in, in this in this thing of just like working on a lot of the mathematics. I think that us as a Julia community can probably work to add more GUIs to the software that we have. But um, that probably will come as, you know, with commercial enterprises, usually commercial and entities build the GUIs. Yeah. 
Amazing. And speaking of commercial use, um, what are some applications in the industry? Um, I saw something about the aerospace industry and are, are there more industries that are applying uh, scientific machine learning? Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on in aerospace industries, in uh, robotics industries. The one that I know a lot about is pharmacology because um, I'm in, in the pharmacology uh, area. So um, so Pumas AI is this uh, startup that I'm, I'm a part of. I'm the director of scientific research. It started out with um, just building. So uh, for, for the research I was doing to be able to um, do model informed drug development, I wrote this package in Julia, which was for... Um, which was for building these pharmacological simulations. So nonlinear mixed effects models, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. Um, and uh, and what, what has happened was we realized that we were able to get speed advantages over some of these old Fortran libraries um, because of this, because of these differential equation solvers that we had, right? That that was really our competitive advantage going in. So we, you know, we now compose, you know, pharmacometrics on top of these differential equation solvers, and we got something that was very, that was very exciting. And in order to um, make it be very useful to the pharmacological com community, we launched a startup around it. So that way we can make sure that we could, you know, get get the funds to be able to do the FDA validation, get this into real pharmaceutical companies. Like uh, um, can't mention who they are right now. Uh, but y you might know that there's some uh, very, very th there's some very, there's, there's a disease that a lot of people have right now. And there's some vaccines people are wanting to make for it that, you know, it, there, there are some Cambridge companies that are pu very publicly working on, on those vaccines. And, you know, we, we, we have the software now being used to be able to accelerate those processes, right? And so in the pharmacometrics community, we've seen a lot of adoption. Um, so uh, I know that in uh, in power grid modeling, that's another industry. Uh, mo more of that is in the national labs, but that still has like a, a very um, uh, strong use. Um, batteries are, are one area that people have been seeing a lot of uh, use cases. And so I demonstrated one where, you know, the scientific machine learning was able to beat the state of the art battery model by about 20%. And that's actually finding uh, customers pretty immediately. We're also, you, you know, so there's so many different areas. It's hard. I can a talk you could do a talk on its own just like an hour long talk just listing off people who are using it in industry so okay uh so besides uh going to juliacon.org and listening to the amazing workshops and talks uh what are some resources our audience can uh, read books or articles or things like that that you recommend yeah so um so yeah, you, you, if you go to julianlang.org, you'll find a lot of resources there, right? You'll find a lot of tutorials, you'll find a lot of blogs that, you know, because there's a, lot, there's a whole blogosphere that's writing about the language and how to use it. Um, but I'd say that the actual best resource is the Julia Slack, right? So go to slack, uh, slackinvite.julialang.org, get an invite to the Slack, and just start talking to the people there. These people are the people who are building the Julia compiler, they're building the Julia packages, I'm there. Um, you know, so a lot of people who are working on the Julia programming language are have all really come together to be able to go to this chat channel and just talk about, you know, day and night with this thing that we're building. Um, and so if, if you, if you want to get into the community, I uh, just, just join, just ask, ask for the Slack invite and we'll let, we'll let you right in and you can, you know, if you want to start contributing or if you just want to start using it, um, just, you know, ask us questions, uh, have fun with it. Amazing. So thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, from what we have seen today, the Julia community seems very open and exciting and a really lively place to be. So I think uh, many of us will be joining soon. Uh, so yeah. expect people from Argentina, especially. Um, thank you very much uh, from me for being here. And to our audience, uh, please go to juliacon.org to listen to more amazing talks. And yeah, download the Julia language and start exploring. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, Chris. And yep, thank see you. you around. <laughs> bye. Yep, bye bye.